hesitated to move against the very popular general, even when MacArthur's statements criticizing the administration policy in the Far East were made public. MacArthur's letter to Republican congressional leader Joe Martin stating that, quote, there was no substitute for victory, end of quote, coupled with MacArthur's public dismissal of discussing anything other than complete surrender with the People's Republic of China was the final act, uh, they, they were the final acts of defiance as far as Truman was concerned. Truman felt that the dismissal of MacArthur was absolutely essential to maintain the constitutional mandate for civilian control of the military. In addition, by April of 1951, General Matthew Ridgway would replace General uh, Walton Walker as the, the commander of 8th Army in Korea and of the UN Command in, in Korea itself. Ridgway had already emerged as the de facto commander of American and UN forces in, in Korea. Um, in fact, uh, MacArthur's uh, management of the Korean War was, was not very much, was, was uh, other than uh, the overall strategy, it was not much of a hands-on operation. Uh, during the time that MacArthur was commander of the UN forces in Korea, he did not spend a single night in Korea. He would fly in from Tokyo, where his headquarters were in the Daiichi building. He would drive around the jeep, have lots of photographs taken, you know, award people medals, and be pictured with his uh, binoculars, you know, looking off into the distance. But uh, uh, it was really Ridgeway who was the, 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 the de facto commander, uh, beginning really in, in, uh, uh, in January of 19. 51. MacArthur's uh, statements calling for an expansion of the war in Korea were in direct opposition to the President's goals. Wanting to keep the war confined to the Korean Peninsula, Truman rejected the idea that MacArthur called for of invading the People's Republic of China and ruled out any use of nuclear weapons. Uh, in part, Truman ruled out the use of nuclear weapons because he, he, was, he was shocked at the devastation that they had caused in Japan. Now, there was a third uh, nuclear bomb uh, on its way to be used against Japan, and Truman halted it after the reports came in of what the first two bombs had done. Uh, in addition, the talk of going nuclear just uh, scared the heck out of the American uh, allies. Uh, since this is the Royal Asiatic Society, I should point out that the uh, British Prime Minister Clement Attlee was particularly upset when Truman, in one of his uh, press conferences, when asked if, the, if there was a possibility of using uh, nuclear weapons against China or uh, North Korea, China, or even the Soviet Union during this conflict, Truman said that all options are on the table and decisions on these tactics will be left to commanders of the field. Well, Attlee immediately called the White House <coughs> made arrangements to come to, to fly to Washington to meet with Truman to get a clarification on that because the British were terrified of the notion that the war could go nuclear. The Soviet Union had already demonstrated their capacity to build nuclear bombs. They had tested one in late 1949. So, so they had nuclear weapons. They didn't have the intercontinental ballistic missiles that they have today, but they had conventional bombers that could have easily reached London, Manchester, uh, you know, part, parts of Western Europe, uh, Busan, Tokyo, uh, all sorts of places. And the, the, for the Allies, especially the uh, really important Allies like the British in the newly formed NATO, the notion of uh, a war in East Asia expanding into a nuclear confrontation was, uh, was a pretty scary thing. So Truman made the decision that this war would be a limited war for both uh, domestic and uh, international uh, strategic uh, reasons. Finally, uh, with regard to the peace negotiations themselves and the decision that Truman made as to how they would be conducted, uh, the peace negotiations at Hamun John proved to be a particularly frustrating and puzzling aspect of the Korean War as far as the American public was concerned. Once China intervened in 1950, Truman had concluded 
that Korea could not be unified under a pro-Western government unless the United States has allies who are willing to risk the expansion of the conflict into a third world war, a war possibly involving the use of atomic weapons. <coughs> the problematic peace talks with the Chinese and North Koreans followed the United Nations Command Spring Offensive of 1951, when General Matthew Ridgway's counteroffensive succeeded in stabilizing the front and roughly reestablishing the status quo antebellum. I always like to throw in a Latin phrase whenever I give a talk. <laughs> when I was in, high, in Catholic high school, I had to learn a lot of Latin. And whenever I get a chance, I just throw it in. So, status quo antebellum, just stick with me on that one. Uh, nevertheless, uh, once the negotiations began in 1951, uh, they dragged on for two years. Um, Truman had decided to settle for an agreement assuring the basic objectives that had been defined by the United Nations at the onset of the conflict, the defense of South Korea from communist aggression. But furthermore, Truman held firm on the issue of involuntary repatriation of thousands of prisoners of war held by the UN command. He had strong moral objections to returning POWs to communist countries. The communist governments, Truman said, have no sense of honor and no moral code. The president was unwilling to see the same sort of uh, tragic situation take place in Korea that had taken place in, in Eastern Europe at the end of the Second World War. At that time, many uh, soldiers who had been with the Soviet military, captured by the Germans, were returned to the Soviet Union rather than be welcomed home as, as heroes by the Soviet regime, they were looked upon as traitors, as suspect, as people who lived in, who, who were members of ethnic uh, minorities who might be a threat to the Soviet regime. Thousands and thousands of them were sent to the Gulag, many were executed. It was, it was a disaster. Uh, there were instances where, where uh, soldiers, when they were told they were going to be returned to their homeland in the Soviet Union, actually committed suicide rather than be returned. And Truman knew uh, that many of the prisoners held by the UN command and the ROK, um, both Chinese and Koreans, were not at all loyal to the North Korean regime. In fact, many of the prisoners were actually South Koreans. I mean, they were people who had been pressed into service by the North Koreans. The North Koreans came down in September um, they had been given a stick or something, you know, to fight with and told when other people die, you get their guns and, and whatever. So they had no desire to go back to North Korea. They weren't even North Koreans. The same was true with many of the Chinese prisoners. Um, they were actually nationalists who had been surrendered to the forces of Mao Zedong, the communist forces, in 1948 and 49. And when the Chinese entered the war, among those that Mao Zedong sent in to fight in North Korea were these questionable, you know, these former nationalist soldiers of questionable loyalty. We'll put them on the front, you know, and uh, uh, if they were going to lose some soldiers, we'll lose these guys. Well, of course, many of those did not want to go back to the uh, uh, People's Republic of, of China. <coughs> and and there, there was a lot of controversy within the, the camps themselves. There were riots. There were pro-communists who tried to persuade some of their colleagues they need to go back to China or North Korea. There were um, South Koreans who tried to persuade the North Koreans. It was, it was a terribly messy situation. But Truman was unwilling to make a, a, a peace settlement that did not allow for some sort of uh, voluntary repatriation uh, supervised by neutral countries. And it, it took a long time for that uh, to come about. Uh, the peace agreement, or the, the armistice, I should say, there is no treaty. The armistice uh, uh, was finally signed after Truman had left office during the Eisenhower administration. The president of South Korea, E. Sigmund, tried to scuttle the whole peace agreement by releasing tens of thousands of prisoners, of Korean prisoners, held by the UN, by the ROK forces. He, e. Sigmund knew they were loyal to South Korea, but rather than wait for the armistice, he just let them all, told the guards, let them all go out into the population, hoping that this would disrupt the peace 
the negotiations so they would continue on and the, the war would continue and Korea could be united. Well, um, let, let me conclude by saying that in the final year of his presidency, oh, I, oh, I have another slide I wanted to share with you. This is uh, MacArthur's letter. Uh, again, these are all declassified, usually in the 1970s. This is part of the collection of the Truman Presidential Library. I deeply regret that it becomes my duty as President and Commander in Chief you know, to relieve you all your commands. I don't think Truman really deeply regretted it. He <laughs> <laughs> said that himself. Um, and this is the peace negotiations at uh, Pama John. And this is my final slide. In 1952, the final year of his presidency, Truman's public approval rating among American voters reached an all-time low. It was in the mid 20% uh, range, uh, a, a low rating of approval that lasted for more than 50 years. It wasn't until 2008 that George W. Bush snatched the record from Harry Truman and got an even lower public approval rating in the, in the low 20s. Um, obviously, the difficult decisions Truman made concerning the Korean War were extremely unpopular with the American public at the time. However, Truman is now rated by scholars of American history as one of our five or six greatest presidents. This is in large measure a result of President Truman's critical decisions made during the Korean War. In retrospect, Truman's decisions on Korea are seen as wise and prudent. Let me spend just a, a second here to talk about Truman's justification for his decision. This is from Truman's memoirs written in 1953 and 54. He says in the highlighted area, the situation in Korea, it should be pointed out, was not the only instance of new aggression on the part of communist China. He goes on to say the Chinese were still in trouble in Indochina, which of course was the fact. Then the next one, next paragraph is highlighted, our British allies and many statesmen of Europe saw the Chinese moves, which earlier on Truman talks about the Chinese as acting as surrogates for the Soviet Union, which has started the whole thing. Our British allies and many statesmen in Europe saw the Chinese moves as a ruse to halt American aid in rebuilding of Europe. They knew that nothing had hurt world communism worse than the policy of the United States to aid Greece and Turkey, the Marshall Plan, the decision to hold fast in Berlin, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Then finally at the bottom, I had no intention of allowing our attention to be diverted from the unchanging aims and designs of Soviet policy. I knew that in our age, Europe, with its millions of skilled workmen, its factories and transportation networks, is still the key to world peace. So whether one still agrees with that or not, whether it's true today, uh, as maybe Truman saw it being the case in the 1950s, it does very frankly express why Truman made some of the decisions that he made. And of those decisions, I think it's fair to say <coughs> that for six decades, peace has prevailed among the nations of the Far East. And all, with the exception of North Korea, have experienced more than a half a century of unparalleled prosperity. To what extent the Korean War and the decisions Truman made during that war are responsible for this era, era of peace, maybe future historians further removed from the situation will have uh, a more objective uh, analysis. Uh, but I think at this, e even now, more than half a century removed, uh, I think we have to give Truman's decisions some credit. So it's been a pleasure speak with you tonight and I'll be happy to take any questions if there are. So